Okay, hello, good morning, and a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, to this, the third and final day of the Electricity Storage Network's annual conference 2023. Uh, great to have you with us today. Uh, there'll be a number of you still filtering in. So um, to those who've joined us today, then this is your first session, welcome. Uh, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat on the Zoom uh, call there. Say where you're dialing in from today and who you're with. Um, and for those who have joined us all the way, uh, for, for this year's event from the in-person event in the IET in London on Tuesday and on the online session yesterday and for a third instalment today of all things electricity storage, then welcome back. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the last two days of discussions that we've had. Uh, we're really pleased with the event this year and all the discussion that we've had around a, a variety of topics. So my name is Ray Arrell. I'm head of Future Energy Systems here at Regen. And I'm part of the team who manage the electricity storage network in-house. The ESN, for those who are not familiar, uh, is the only industry organization dedicated to supporting the electricity storage sector in the UK. So this session today, if we move on to the next slide, um, we will be focusing on how we're gonna be discussing and exploring how we enable long duration storage uh, for a net zero system. So we've got an hour session this morning. Then at midday, uh, my colleague Sophie Winnie will be chairing a session around fire safety innovation and best practice. And then at three o'clock, uh, the last session of this year's conference will be chaired by the head of the ESN here at Regen, Ollie Franklin, uh, to explore grid connections, the challenge of connecting sites uh, and looking at the evolution of storage on the horizon. Uh, many would have hopefully seen the graphic that we put out about the size of the growing pipeline for storage projects. So connecting assets and projects to the grid remains a big challenge. So we'll be exploring that in our final session of the day. So this session, um, as I said, we'll be, is exploring long duration. It's a panel session um, and we'll be using um, the, the Q&A function uh, to, to put some uh, questions to the, to the panel that we have with us today. Um, so please open that up um, across the discussion that we have. Please put in your questions to the panel. Please use the upvote. So like the questions that you want to see, they will float to the top for me uh, and we'll, we'll put those to the panel. Uh, please also use the chat function to discuss as we have the session along today. Introduce yourselves and, uh, and continue the discussion as well. And lastly, we'll be recording uh, the session, uh, which will be uploaded to the event website uh, before, um, yeah, pretty soon, pretty soon after the event will be uploaded. So I think that's all of the housekeeping out of the way. And um, we've got a good number of people in the room. So we're up to 130. So hello and good morning. Thanks for being with us. If we, uh, we get onto the topic, so long duration energy storage has been uh, a topic that we at the ESN have been interested in for a while. We've been exploring it in the Innovation and Technology Working Group, one of the working groups that we have. Um, and you know, Bayes, the system operator, Ofgem, and a number of industry analysts have been, well, we've identified long duration storage as a critical uh, technology class to enable the electricity system um, to achieve net zero. Over the past couple of years, there have been a number of tangible happenings, policy developments and industry uh, publications uh, looking around long duration storage, its role, how to enable it, how to develop it. Um, and this timeline on screen sort of lifts out some of those developments that we've seen to date. So if we wind the clock back to the end of 2021, Bayes put out a call for evidence around facilitating large scale long duration storage. The ESN actually responded to that as a joint response, highlighting issues around needing to move away from rigid definitions, recognizing and incentivizing the different services and component parts of long duration storage, the large scale, the long duration, the long term services. The need to identify the system needs, uh, the use cases, tailored markets that are required to incentivize development, as well as ensuring there is a range of technologies that can uh, deliver long duration services. 
Then we also had two stages of grant funding or two rounds of uh, grant funding that they put out through the Long Duration Storage Competition Fund. So in February and November last year, there were two tranches of successful projects securing funding to be developed, which is great to see. Um, and then we've, alongside that, we've had a number of industry studies looking at long duration. So I'm delighted to be joined by Emma Woodward from Aurora today, who put out a publication in February uh, around long duration in GB. Many would have seen the uh, AFRI report that was commissioned by BASE looking at the benefits of long duration in the system, which was published mid last year. Um, and Regen has worked with the system operator uh, on, on a study called a day in the life of the electricity system in 2035, which looks at two challenging system days in the summer and the winter. And one of the conclusions was that long duration storage has a part to play in helping the system to balance and be managed during those two uh, challenging days. So a lot has happened. More interventions and analysis is going to happen. And the ESN is looking further at our position as, as an industry organization on how to enable and champion and challenge long duration storage in the UK. So today is a chance to explore that further. So if you move on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, there's a number of different things we could explore and talk about long duration storage as a subsector. It's a big topic, but distilling some of the areas that have kind of floated to the top from the discussions we've had to date. Um, we wanna talk about the system need. We wanna talk about technology diversity uh, and, and potential of, of different technologies to actually provide long duration services. We wanna talk about the, the markets and finance, uh, the incentives to actually drive project development. And also a topic that has come back time and time again is how we actually define long duration storage, how we classify it as a technology and sub-technology. Um, and yeah, so we wanna, we wanna dwell on some of these topics. Um, and so to help me talk through some of this, I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of long duration storage experts. So we're joined today from representatives from different perspectives of the energy system. So we have Sophie Orm, who is the commercial director at Reenergize, uh, a live on the ground long duration technology developer. We have Alex Hart, the EV and storage manager at the system operator, bringing the system operator's perspective on the role of long duration storage. We have Amma Saleh, who is the project manager for innovation at Bayes, providing a policy perspective on an experience of managing the long duration innovation competition funds. And we have Emma Woodward, who's the project lead at Aurora Energy Research, um, who's bringing a modeling and systemic modeling perspective uh, on, on the role of long duration storage. So thank you very much to everyone uh, for being here today. And thank you to my panelists. So first of all, let's get into a, a bit of a discussion. Um, so with the recent context that I've summarized there and some of the happenings over the past year or so, and your experience working in this space, can I ask each of you to introduce yourselves and maybe share a bit about your relationship with long duration storage so far and, and your role? So uh, maybe let's start with Emma Woodward from Aurora. Emma. Hi, thanks, Ray. Um, and thanks so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, as you have sort of already mentioned in your introduction, I'm Emma Woodward. I'm a project leader on Aurora Energy Research's advisory team. Um, and I work mainly in the, the low carbon flexibility space um, and also in our hydrogen research. Uh, but in particular, as part of that lead, um, most of the thinking that we do around long duration energy storage. Um, so Aurora sort of really had identified uh, about the time that Bayes put out its consultation in September 2021, that there was a need for sort of more systematic thinking around um, the, the need for long duration storage, its use cases, uh, but also research into sort of the revenues that uh, new projects might be able to access um, and how that fed into uh, the potential need for support. Um, and so I've led a lot of that work and I've continuing to be working with um, investors, with asset developers um, and with policymakers on, um, on how all the different aspects of thinking here can, can be pulled together. Great. Thanks very much, Emma. Great to have you with us. 
Um, Alex, Alex Hart from the, from the system. Hello, so uh, I'm Alex Hart. I am the EV and storage manager. So I run a small team that looks at, well, everything to do with EVs and storage and the, the interaction between that and the things the ESO is responsible for. That relatively small team sits in a, in a larger team, which is the zero carbon operation team. Uh, and the purpose of that broader team is to think about all of the things that the ESO is going to have to do to operate a zero carbon system. Uh, we generally look at the period 2025 to 2035, and that's that's the period where the system is going to go from operating zero carbon a few times over the year to operating zero carbon all of the year continuously. Um, and to do that, the system is going to need capabilities it doesn't have yet. And the ESO is going to need capabilities it doesn't have yet. So we have programs in place to develop those capabilities, to work out what it is, what is it that we will need to be capable of that we're not now? And uh, what do we have to do to get there? What's the program of work that builds that capability? Um, we're a pretty small team, so it's other parts of the ESO that then do that work and, and deliver the capability. We're more of a coordinating function and trying to work out that all those things add up to everything you need to run a system that is zero carbon and secure and efficient. So that's that's the purpose of the broader team. So within that, my storage bit of that is we're trying to understand the role of long duration storage. Well, uh, I guess all types of storage, but particularly long duration storage in uh, in a zero carbon system. So trying to work out how much we need uh, and what it's going to do, what services it will provide. Um, and I guess that's all bundled up in, well, what's everything else doing? Um, I, I guess it's not always a popular statement, but the system doesn't need storage per se. It needs a set of services and long duration storage is well placed to provide a set of those services, but so are other technologies. So then trying to work out what is the right mix of all those technologies and, and where does storage fit in that? Um, so I work the, the main teams I would work with. There's um, the teams working out that what are the future needs um, and uh, on how does storage fit in that? What are the future market arrangements that you would need to to get the storage operating? And what are the future services we might want to buy? Um, and and then the sort of the how much? Uh, so all the scenario work to try and work out well how, how much storage will there be? Brilliant. So a number of areas that your team is looking at is is overlapping with some of the things we're hoping to discuss today so that's that's great great to have you with us alex uh, Amir from base thank you Ray. yeah so Amir here um my my team and i deliver bases energy storage innovation competitions the ones that you flagged up on the slide before uh so that's a 68 million pound longer duration energy storage program and a 20 million pound uh, storage at scale program which is all about trying to develop first of a kind um, energy storage um, demonstrators, bumping them up the TRL levels uh, to a point where you know they can be demonstrated in, in operational environments. Um, my focus is on energy storage, but I'm part of a kind of a wider team looking at all things smart and, and flexibility. Um, so the, the team also co-manages a, a 65 million pound flexibility innovation program looking at you know, some of the things that were mentioned on the call just now, EVs, um, interoperable demand side response, um, and alternative energy markets, um, everything that we need, uh, that, that we think we're going to need to move towards a smart and flexible grid. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Emma. Um, and Sophie, Sophie from Reenergize. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Sophie. So um, Reenergize is based in uh, London and also our r and is in Montreal. There's, we're around 20 people. And our solution is based on a form of pumped hydro, which is a mechanical form of energy storage where you have fluid at the top of a mountain in a reservoir, fluid at the bottom, and you pump the fluid up the hill when prices are low and you release it when prices are high and use the fluid to generate. So our innovation on pumped hydro is that we use a high density fluid instead of water. And that high density uh, makeup has the equivalent of two and a half times the energy of water. And so the advantage that gives us is we only need hills rather than mountains. So we open up an order of magnitude more sites. And we've done a GIS study in the UK to look at that and see there are thousands of site opportunities that could deliver 
the uh, the targets we've got in in Great Britain for long duration storage. Um, the other advantage is it's much quicker to scale. So pumped hydro, which has been around for a hundred years, so it's the most mature form of long duration storage. Um, it takes a long time to develop the very large projects around a decade. And we're looking to mimic the timelines of wind and solar and lithium ion batteries. So bringing that around to 18, 12 to 18 months to develop and similar time frame to construct. Um, I mentioned we're a startup, so we're benefiting from one of AMA's um, funds and we're looking to build out our first really significant scale project um, this year near Plymouth. We're just in planning for that at the moment. And that will be a 500 kilowatt, um, two to four hour system. Uh, so that's really exciting. And then my role as commercial director, I'm looking to partner with developers who may have grid connections for sites that might be close to a hill. And we need, um, an elevation of somewhere between 75 and 300 meters to make our system work well. And we're, we're in the, the space of say five megawatts to hundred megawatts for each system. So I'll, I'll stop right. talking there, Ray. No, that's fantastic. And great to, to, to have someone involved in developing projects on the ground on the call today. So really appreciate you being with us. Okay, so um, just from those introductions, there's a myriad of things that we could talk about um, and uh, just wanted to reiterate, please do drop in your questions. I can see there's some already dropping in. Uh, fantastic to see. So drop in anything you want the panel to answer. Um, and if you have one specifically for one of the panel, please do say in your question and don't forget to upvote the ones that you'd like to see answered, even if you don't have a question yourself. So I'd like to start with how we define long duration. It's a topic that um, has come up often. Uh, a lot of people have sort of said we shouldn't get hung up on it. And I do I kind of agree with that principle and we need to get on with developing technology and projects. Um, but I think it's important to talk about what we mean by long duration. Um, so a number of the studies that have come out uh, categorize storage by hours of duration, by scale of megawatts, but also by technology type or banding. Um, so there's a number of different ways that we could cut long duration as a theme, as a subsector. So I'd like to ask each of you, um, how should we be defining long duration storage? Should we be absolutely clear, um, short, medium, long in hours, as you know, I think the AFRI report has a specific set of bands? Uh, should we be looking at you know, the scale of the asset as it's delivering services, so small and large megawatts, should we distinguish that? Or is that sort of pigeonholing the market a bit too much? And do we want to be a little bit more sort of broad? Um, and, you know, we can consider how we define long duration in law, in planning, in, in policy, uh, business rates even. So just views, anything that comes to your mind about how we should be defining long duration storage in order to enable it. Uh, I'm going to come first to Anna. Um, views from yourself and your colleagues uh, at base on, on, on this. Yeah, so I think uh, a good place to start. I think, um, obviously, you know, you said it yourself, you know, people define it in different ways. Um, and uh, you look across the um, kind of the LS Council and every other body and define it in all the kind of different ways. In, the, uh, in our innovation program, we've defined it as longer rather than long duration energy. And, and that's all about longer than what we think is kind of economically viable um, in terms of the technologies of today. So that's longer than four hours. Um, but that's not necessarily to say that's what long duration is. Um, you know, I don't know if the definition should change, but I feel like there should be an agreed definition for the categories, um, really because of, of what you just said in terms of, you know, I can imagine a scenario where you know, it'll be important in terms of regulation. It'll be important in terms of, you know, the financial uh, in incentives that get set out. And, you know, you don't want to be a developer that's developed a, you know, four or five hour system to then not be able to benefit from the six hour regulations or incentives that come out. So I think there's certainly a need for standardization. There's certainly a need for benchmarking. I don't know what the answer is, but, but I'd certainly welcome, uh, you know, the industry coming together and being able to, to 
compartmentalize um, the durations and the capacities. Um, I think just to add to that, you know, that was a question that was asked in the uh, in the consultation. Yeah. And you know, the answers that came back were, you know, across the spectrum. So I think you know, there's some work to do to get us all aligned, but I think it's definitely a good thing to do. Perfect. Okay. Thanks very much. Um... Emma, I'd like to come to you next, I guess, Aurora's views on this from the analysis that you published last year, categorising in, in terms of different hours and the services that they're meeting. What are your thoughts on, on how we define long duration? Yeah, I have to agree um, with your comment, um, sort of as you were posing this question. I don't think it's too helpful to have a, a very strict definition of this. Um, instead, I prefer to think about it in terms of what we're trying to use long duration storage for. I think a lot of short duration batteries can be used to provide frequency response services to the grid, can be, provide, can be used to, to sort of meet evening peaks um, in demand. Whereas really long duration storage technologies are, are unlikely to be used in that way. We're more likely to be, to be thinking about meeting um, or, or what is gonna be supplying um, power when intermittent renewables are not generating. So really, from our perspective, we want to be thinking about what sort of durations um, are you actually going to be needing to, uh, to fill in those gaps when wind isn't, uh, isn't generating. Um, even then, there's a lot of different ways that you could cut that. Um, but I, and I wouldn't necessarily want to put a, a direct number on it. Having said that, uh, it probably is helpful to, to assign a number just in terms of ensuring that um, you know, in terms of regulation, people know what they're working towards. So the four hour definition that, um, that Bayes had suggested in the consultation is probably as good as any to be working with um, from my perspective. Okay. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, Sophie, I'd like to come to you. So you mentioned your two to four hour system that you're piloting in Plymouth, just down the road from where we are here in Exeter. Um, what, what do you feel about defining assets? As someone who's developing a project, who has to consider planning applications, uh, you know, actually the financing of the project on the ground, connecting to the grid as a generation asset, as a, as a subset of generation. What would be beneficial for you as a developer in terms of how we could define long duration? Yeah, so um, the, the system in Plymouth was the, the smallest duration. We thought we needed to prove the case, but our um, our technology sort of sits in the four to, to 16 hour space. And I, I think um, I think the Aurora report and the Bayes report is really helpful. Um, I, I think you do need a definition, um, a minimum in terms of duration and, and the four hours is fine. Um, for now, we've seen in other markets incentives getting ratcheted up for longer durations for six hours and then eight hours. And I think it's important um, that that is planned for because that the need is clearly going to be there um, for those additional hours. And if the need is there and the system benefit is there, then there needs to be incentives that that recognize that extra duration. Um, in terms of the Bayes definition, um, I wouldn't advocate for a minimum system size in terms of megawatts. I, I think you, you if, if the benefits are there, if you're providing the service that is needed and that can be aggregated up to be useful, then um, we don't see it as being helpful to have, say, a minimum of 100 megawatts. Um, we think we could aggregate up lots of 10, 20 megawatts and provide the service that's needed. Um, so I think it is helpful to categorize it. And particularly, you mentioned business rates and planning. Um, it would the, the system needs it and we're going to be in difficulty if we get to 2028 or whatever it is and and those technologies haven't been brought online quickly enough so i think with a minimum duration you need prioritization for grid connection and you need um similar fast tracks through planning business rates etc and that's where the classification is really important great I think a lot of that, you know, echoes some of the views that the ESN shared back with in, to the call for evidence. So uh, I would agree. Um, Alex, I'd like to come to you. So the system operator's perspective on this. So you mentioned about the, the, the actual needs rather than the technologies being built as such. But um, in terms of turning to different 
categories of asset to provide services, would define long duration be a beneficial thing for the system? Um, I think categories can help, particularly if you're going to you know, do any quantification, any modeling, you need to put things in boxes to be able to add them up. Um, so I think you can't get away from needing some boxes. Uh, it's a bit difficult when you've gone last. Everyone's already said all the points already to make, which is a, <laughs> uh, I, I guess, could could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Um, I think when when Bayes uh, did their consultation and they they sort of uh, put a line in the sand at four hours, I, I, there's something useful there. I think it's quite useful to to say there's a bit of the market that seems to be working and we can see how that it works, and then there's another bit that, that's not working yet and we're going to need it. And, and I think it's fine to draw a line and say right on the other side of that line we need to pay some attention. Um, we also, when we responded, uh, effectively what we were saying was fine, but if you're going to call that long, you're going to need another category called very long and probably another one called very, very long because we, we need we need categories longer than that. Um, I think the AFRI definitions uh, for last year are, are pretty helpful. We're sort of um, quite happy to unofficially use those. They, they, they work quite well for us. I think it's, it's true what we said before, like exactly where you draw the boundary doesn't really matter. Um, it, that you could draw it at 12 hours, you could draw it at 18, or you could draw it at eight, and it, it doesn't doesn't matter too much. Um, but I think there's there's sort of a quite nice logic of there's the less than four hours, which we sort of understand, four to 12, which exists a bit at the moment, but there's there's not a lot of it. And then beyond that, th then you're into into a strange new territory. What 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 does a two hour, three hour bit of storage look like? That's that, that that's into a new world. And the modeling suggests there's another category beyond that. So after we kind of explicitly name uh, short, medium and long. And then if you look in, the, in the, the modeling, they've got another category in there, which they didn't call very long, but effectively it's a very long category, which went from three days to 30 days. Um, and and there, is, there is a need for something out there as well. If you're going to have a system dominated by wind, you're going to get um, challenging periods of that sort of duration. Uh, and, and you're gonna need storage for that. So I think, that there is, an, from a system need perspective, it, it is useful to have some categories, and those categories are fine, as, as good as any other. I think you, you need to show that there is something different that happens at the very long end. Um, and I can see from a developer's point of view that the, the technologies providing these are going to be very different, and they're going to have different needs and different kind of build times and various things. So, so I can see some benefit from them. Um, from our perspective, another thing we think about is the sort of the market arrangement and the remuneration. It's not exactly how much money they earn isn't isn't our concern um but they we, we we need they need to earn enough to be able to make sense to build um yeah. and uh those very very long duration assets uh serving very long duration needs are probably going to get used very rarely as the duration gets longer and longer of the service that you're providing the uh frequency with which you need that service gets more and more rare um, and that that has implications for how you design a market to remunerate those assets. Um, so I think that's that's also useful. Once you're out at the sort of 30 day capacity, you're into a very different territory in terms of um, business cases. Uh, so, again, I think that's that's useful. Great. I think um, a lot of what we've just talked through. Is pointing towards. Definition is important, but actually it's about the system need. You know, this a lot of it. All roads lead back to the need. Um, and Axel, I'd like to stay with you if that's all right, because you touched on a few things there. Um, could we think about what do we mean by system need for long duration services? So I agree. You know, the technologies that can provide it is the the response, the reaction, but actually the ask. Um, what could long duration developers be responding to in the future? Wind curtailment, avoidance, solar peak shifting demand management, stability, what what do you see as a system operator as, as the ask? I guess all of the above, but but not all equally. Um, so our team does, that's one of the things we do. So I, I guess our, our main uh, point of contact with the outside world is we publish the operability strategy report once a year, that, that came out uh, end of December, early January. Um, so that's our, that's our big flagship thing, um, which states the system needs across various dimensions. Um, mostly not the dimensions that storage would, would first go after. Um, I, I guess for frequency is in there, but um, there are two new dimensions we added more recently, which are less well-defined. We're, we're in the middle of trying to define them, um, but they're about energy balancing over longer timescales. Uh, one of the new ones is within day flexibility. So we have 
sort of arbitrarily put a definition around that and said it's moving power around within a 24 hour period. Um, and, and again, semi arbitrarily, we said, well, for storage, that means a duration of less than 12 hours because you can't fully cycle anything longer than that. But we're, we're, we're clear, we're explicit in the report that those boundaries are a bit fuzzy, that stuff that's got a longer duration than that could still operate in that space and stuff that's in that space could probably help with longer duration problems as well. Um, and then there's another one which we sort of we call adequacy sometimes as in making sure you have enough generation to get through very long um, periods, but adequacy doesn't really cover it. We also sometimes call it over and under supply, which is a bit of a mouthful, but we're trying to capture the point that if you ignore the oversupply problem, uh, you're going to end up with a with a very expensive system. So sure. you need to be thinking about oversupply and undersupply at the same time. So back, back to your, your question of sort of what, what roles is storage going to play? It's mostly about energy balancing on various timescales. So it's already doing, I guess on the last timescale to be clear, we think about a, a less than 30 minutes timescale and we call that frequency, um, but it's basically energy balancing on a, on a less than 30 minutes because that's the settlement period. So that's, that's when we do most of our frequency management. So storage is going to do energy balancing across all of those timescales. Um, it is already doing very well in the less than 30 minute timescale. It's already the, the it's, we, we've created newer, faster acting services in response to the falling inertia and very fast acting batteries are dominating that market as, as we would expect and, and they're doing fine just there. Um, you then have the next category that's within day flexibility. So for 30 minutes to 24 hours, um, that we see as the, the next rapidly emerging area of technology and storage is going to take a big um, big slice of that um, but it's going to be competing with other things and the other the big obvious one it's going to be competing with is smart charging of electric vehicles so that's um, going to be an, a sort of similarly scaled very large amount of energy moving around within a 24-hour period and storage is going to be uh, in there we've got some some curves in the operability strategy report and again in the in the fed scenarios that show that those two things are both going to grow very fast over the next 10 to 15 years. The, the supply of storage and the supply of flexibility from EVs in that 30 minutes to, to 24 hours phase is going to be a really fast transition in the electricity system. Um, I'm not sure if I'm speaking as officially as ESO in my own personal opinion. I think that's going to be a bigger transition on the electricity system than wind was um, in, in sort of the, the 10 years of wind. The, the way it's going to change the way the system operates is going to be huge. Um, and then probably after that, is the, is the what you do for the, those really long lulls. But again, that's going to be a lot of energy balancing, but in the terawatt hour scale, where you're trying to get months worth of energy in the extreme, maybe a whole winter's worth of energy or, or, or enough energy to get you through a year that is unlike the last 10 years. That's very large amounts of storage to get you through that. Um, so that's all on the energy balancing. The storage can also help you with all the we, we tend to split our needs into energy balancing and not energy balancing. We, the, the, the not energy balancing seems to be is normally more local and about network management. Um, they can help with voltage. They can help with stability. They can help with um, thermal constraints, depending on where they're located and what the technology is. If, um, if they've got a big, heavy spinning piece of kit in the middle of them, uh, that, that makes it easier for them to provide a load of the, the traditional um, stability and voltage services. Even if they haven't, if they're inverter based, they can still help. Um, they, they just got to kind of do more clever things to do the help. Um, but we, we would expect storage to be providing some of those things as well, to think about where they locate and how they are set up to make sure they can also provide those other services. But I'd expect that not to be the bulk of their revenue. They're mostly going to be moving energy and then getting a bit more from these, these more local services. Great. OK, thanks, Alex. Comprehensive views. Um, Emma, I'd like to come to you. Um, so your analysis, hearing the, the system operator's views on potential need, what would you agree? What was long duration storage up to in your as, as a result of your analysis? And, and do, you, do, you, do you see some of those services being key and prime? Yeah, I have to agree with pretty much all of what Alex has just said there. Um, the predominant use case for storage is going to be energy balancing. Um, and he's highlighted that it is likely to be taking place over lots of different timescales. There is one point, though, I guess, in the analysis that we've done surrounding very, very long duration storage needs. And I'm thinking interseasonal here. Um, from the work that we've done, we have sort of suggested that, that might actually be quite hard to achieve through energy storage alone. Um, and you might need to be looking at uh, using things like gas CCS, potentially hydrogen, but likely hydrogen produced from um, SMR plus CCS rather than 
electrolysis to sort of meet um, the real winter peaks there, um, because there is likely, unlikely to be enough um, sort of excess renewable generation um, to produce enough energy to store, to sort of meet those really, really long um, interseasonal gaps that we, we might see. So that's probably one area where I would sort of caution on assuming that we can use storage for to meet every sort of system need. Um, and then kind of coming on to the point on um, system services, again, do agree with what Alex is saying. There are technologies out there that can provide things like reactive power that can do inertia provision, um, but it is likely to be a, a secondary case. And then really there are cheaper technologies available to us, like synchronous compensators or, or flywheels of, of any sort that can also provide those services. So if you really are just looking for inertia provision um, in a particular spot, a, a long duration storage technology is unlikely to be the cheapest available option there. Um, but I, I agree, it will be a, a useful part of the revenue stack um, for the technologies if, if they are also needed for energy balancing. Okay, thanks Emma. Um, I think, Sophie, I'd like to come to you and then we'll probably turn to the Q&A because uh, we're going up to 20 minutes left. Um, so yeah, are those some of the services that you're aiming to go after uh, for you know, not only your pilot plant for future projects and, and, and just reactions to, to some of the suggestions from Alex and Emma there? Yeah, um, a hundred percent, absolutely everything that, that both of them said. And, and going back to the different duration classifications, you've got your short, dom will be dominated by lithium ion, your medium, there's a number of technologies there. And then there's the long seasonal, which hydrogen and um, what, uh, what Emma just, just spoke about, the, those types of technologies. So we're in the medium space and we've got a, a our, our project um, economic model that assumes that the majority of our revenue comes from energy arbitrage, energy balancing services, and then on top of that, capacity market. And I think the reform of the capacity market will be key, particularly to incentivize clean technologies first. So what's providing those services today tends to be uh, gas peakers for that um, evening demand. And our, our challenge is both in increasing long duration, clean forms of long duration storage um, to, to, to replace gas peakers, but also with the, the changing system with the electrification of heat and, and EV, you've got this huge challenge of introducing medium and long duration storage. Um, and so it's, I totally agree with those, those use cases. And then we maybe it'll come on on the Q&A. It's, it's how those market signals um, reward and attract that type of technology and service that the ESA needs. I think there's a number of things that I'd like to loop back to, but um, I'm gonna bring in um, a very patient um, attendees that we've got here. So please, if you've got some other questions, do dive into the Q&A and vote what you want to see. So um, I'll start off with a question for Amir. Um, so a question from Michael here. Uh, we've been trying for, for around six months to access funding and gain traction. Um, oh, the question has just dropped off, sorry. Um, on long duration, of, energy storage system, but I've been unable to access or find any themed rounds either through the UKRI base or the SIF. Uh, where should SMEs like ourselves turn to uh, for funding and support, being that obviously we mentioned that there are some funding rounds on long duration that have been issued to date. Um, yeah, what else is planned I mean, uh, in your innovation team to, uh, to, to, to provide some funding support for SMEs? Yeah, so I think, um... You know, I appreciate the fact that the the innovation competitions, as they are now, are closed competitions, and uh, that funding isn't available. Um, but you know, what we try to do is kind of keep the door open. Um, so you know, if you are an SME and and you have some thoughts about um, you know how we can best develop policies and innov innovation programs going forward, um, you know, then do get in touch. We you know we we I think you know we easy to admit the fact that we don't have a full understanding of, you know, all the technical capabilities out there and all the limitations. So, you know, the door is open to come and speak to us. And then um, I guess, you know, it's a conversation to be had in terms of, you know, what support can BASE give, whether that's financial or not. 
Um, and, you know, if, you know, please do get in touch with me uh, after this meeting. We have, you know, a wide range of contacts from, you know, DIT across UKIB, you know, across lots of different investors um, that could hopefully, you know, be helpful because, um, you know, the reason we run these innovation programs is to support the sector, not necessarily, you know, tie, tie ourselves up to, you know, particular technologies and, and projects. So get in touch. Great. There you go, Michael. You've got a, an opportunity to engage with the Bayes Innovation Team there. Uh, and thanks very much uh, for your question. Um, so I'm going to move on to a question from Steve Browning. Um, so Steve says, one of the big 100% renewable studies suggests stringing four-hour storage to give longer duration, stacking to give power um, required and handle the charging periods. Um, so there's a view here around stringing you know, shorter or medium duration storage systems together, um, uh, as well as developing longer duration. Um, what are the views on that? So maybe I'll come to Emma on that one. Um, so the potential for stringing four hour storage to give longer duration um, rather than developing sites individually. Yeah, overall, I think uh, it is a, a worthwhile thing to think about. Um, you could stack um, lots of four hour batteries together um, and, and use it to sort of balance generation from, from wind in particular. Uh, the advantages of that is you're likely to be able to use four-hour lithium-ion batteries, which are more developed than a lot of newer uh, long-duration storage technologies out there. Um, I guess the disadvantage is, is you are sort of increasing your reliance on lithium if you're going down that route. Um, and going forwards, like lithium supply chains might not actually um, sort of support that um, if we're thinking about running our whole system in that way. Um, so I think it is a good idea, um, but I wouldn't want to suggest that we could rely on that entirely going forwards. And I do think there is a need still to be thinking about other types of technologies of longer durations. Um, rather than just sort of repeatedly using technologies that are already available to us. Like we do need to be looking forward to. Okay, thanks. Um, Sophie, anything to add on stacking for our systems rather than developing longer? Yeah, just drawing on Emma's point, um, if, if in the world today, 98% of global storage is pumped hydro. And it feels like we've had this huge boom in lithium iron, which we have, but because it's short duration, it just doesn't really eat into um, the, the amount of storage that is needed today and needed going forward. So I, I think it would be foolish to rely on that technology to, to provide in terms of sticking, uh, in terms of stacking. Um, particularly um, that the reliance on that supply chain. So um, yeah, definitely that that could work. Um, it might be operationally tricky to incentivize and manage and call on those different um, forms, but I, I leave that to others to worry about. I, th I think you can't go away from the challenge of supporting other technologies that are, are better suited to, to the long duration and looking at what support packages are needed to do that. Thanks very much, um, Sophie. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna move on to a question around um, curtailment. So, um, so there's a question from Andy here, and there's a couple of others who have mentioned it in terms of the Scotland border as well. Um, so we currently pay offshore wind farms to turn down generation. Um, do you see allowing wind farms to generate them to be stored? Uh, oh, sorry, camera just moved there slightly. Uh, apologies. apologies. Um, yeah, so do you see wind curtailment um, and, and the potential for wind farms to, um, be, to pay to store their energy rather than to be turned down a better way of enabling and supporting the, the, the system? And is, yeah, wind curtailment a, a key uh, function that we see long duration storage playing? Um, Alex, I'll come to you on that one. Yeah, so I think, I guess one thing, um, with the, the word curtailment, curtailment and constraint, we're, we're thinking, we think about two different types of reasons why you've got too much wind. It could be, there's too much nationally for energy reasons, or there's too much locally for wire reasons, we're like capacity. Um, we're, we're thinking about trying to use two different words internally, uh, constraint and curtailment, and try and use the curtailment exclusively for the energy 
uh, version of that. I, I don't know how successful we'll be because we use them interchangeably internally already. So it's, it's gonna be quite hard to convince ourselves internally to do it and then convince everyone else to, but that, that's the idea because they are quite different problems um, and it will be useful to be able to talk about the two individually. Um, the curtailment for energy reasons, we're not really seeing, or we're only just starting to see now, it's going to become the next big issue that that, that it's, it's not about the wires there's just too much nationally at certain times and and what's the right solution for that um but the the sort of the more burning issue right now is there's too much for the wires in certain locations uh fundamentally because the industry can build wind faster than it can build wires um i think the long-term solution is we need more wires um that but the 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 wires take so long to build that we can't just sit and do nothing for the 10 years or so that it takes to, to get the transmission capacity. So you, you have to find other things to do. Um, I guess though, you wouldn't want to, um, you wouldn't want to assume that current levels of, of constraint and the constraint that we're expecting say between now and, and 2030s, um, that that's gonna continue forever. So if you're building a business case around that level of constraint, you, you wanna make sure you've got sort of assets that are only gonna live about that long because we wouldn't expect to have that level of constraint all the way out um, it, to say 2050s. Uh, I, think, I think it's a fairly obvious thing to say that there's a lot of energy being wasted at the moment that you could do something useful with. Um, and there's a lot of money being spent on constraint payments um, that, that are, you know, maybe there are better things you could do with that money. Um, so I, th I think there are opportunities to do things with that energy. Um, we had a look, I think it's two years ago now, um, at whether lots of storage is the solution, whether you could put lots of storage in just the right location, say either, either side of B6 and other highly constrained boundaries, and whether you could fix the problem that way. Um, and we found that although, that basically it's very hard to do that, it's very hard to actually make the storage cover its own costs by reducing constraint payments, mainly because of the, the timings of the wind constraints that they, um, you have very long periods of continual constraint where the storage could help for a few hours until it's full and then it's sat unable to help uh, and then the, the constraint goes away and the storage can discharge and then it's waiting for the next constraint and and that pattern of very long periods of constrained and then not constrained tends to lead to the storage not getting to operate very often um so i, I think storage can help i think it's 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 not as all if it's not as obviously the right solution as it might seem to be from a simplistic analysis. If you then look closely at what's happening wire by wire and think, right, if I put storage on that particular location, what activity would it get? Um, it's, it's not as compelling as you might think. So I think storage is, can help, it should be part of their case, um, but I think it's not, it's not gonna be a silver bullet for fixing constraints. Yep, I think that makes sense. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Rachel, have just put a link into a publication that we've done recently about um, con transmission network constraint management. Um, so there's there's a number of things that you touched on there that we, we've explored. Um, so you mentioned there, and this relates to wind constraints and, and, and the boundary uh, about location. Um, so Sophie, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, so yeah, wind curtailment as a service, appreciate, appreciate your views on that. But in terms of where projects could be cited, so long duration projects, is this something you see for yourselves as a, as a more resource availability driven assessment? Or are you going after services that are more locationally targeted? Um, or do you see it being a bit of a blend of the two? Um, yeah, location and, and, and wind curtailment services. Your views on Yeah, those. good good question. Um, and currently thinking along the lines of blend because we, we don't know what all those future revenues are. Um, we've got hills around the country, we've got a lot of hills in Scotland, just that side of um, the, the B, B6 connection, um, and a, a lot of wind coming on board. So it, it, it just it just feels like that could be a good place to site, um, and, and, and a place where a lot of pumped hydro has been sited to date. Um, but as, as Alex just said, we couldn't rely on that revenue stream. It's just an indicator that it might be enhanced beyond um, the, the, the arbitrage and capacity market and a few other services that we're, we're looking at. We, ha we are thinking about behind the meter co-location, and that was talked about on your 
call yesterday. Um, so obviously it's it's hard to come by grid connections and the, the easier easiest place to, to site would be co-located with solar that's predictable and very complementary um, and, and sort of sits well with that four to eight hour duration. Um, we, I'm really interested in looking at the analysis of co-located behind the meter with wind or locationally in the same area of the network um, as wind. Um, but it's it's a it's a trickier one to 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 forecast because of that unpredictability. And I think like batteries do today, I think you would need to stack and you would need smart optimization to look at weather forecasts to be agile to, to switch the use case. Um, so, so my conclusion is it, it's a factor and it's, but it's not the primary driver. The primary driver is where you can get grid for us, where there's a hill and then relatively um, looking at the area of constraint. Thanks Sophie. Um, so mindful of the time we've got left, so I'm going to um, try to answer a couple of questions at once here. So uh, Thomas and also Nick have raised the topic of hydrogen. Um, so number of analyses sort of includes hydrogen in the mix as a long duration storage service. You know, in terms of electricity storage, there's other considerations there about the production of hydrogen, as well as the, uh, the discharge element of hydrogen through hydrogen peaking plants and therefore potentially displacing existing fossil gas peaking plants. Um, so what are the views on the role of hydrogen in this topic? Is it a subset of, a, of long duration storage? Should we be treating it uh, as part of uh, the technology mix? Is it a separate thing altogether? You know, long duration technologies being developed, electricity, and then hydrogen is, is another uh, type of technology band or, or, or area. Uh, maybe if I come to you, Amir, first, um, the projects that have been supported through the competition funds, there's obviously a mixture in there. Hydrogen is probably part of that, but I guess there's a distinguishment between power to X and, and electricity storage. What are your views on hydrogen and the policy incentives that exist for that and how it plays into the long duration topic? I think, oh, well, there's a lot of that. So I think, uh, just trying to unpack that. So I think, um, you know, like you said, in our, innovation portfolio um, we haven't um, excluded hydrogen projects so we very much see them as part of that long duration energy storage conversation um, now clearly there's you know challenges around hydrogen the hydrogen economy and how it kind of the future of hydrogen in general um, we are if you look across the uh, the net zero innovation portfolio and for those of you who are, haven't heard of that before it's essentially it's a, a billion pound commitment to uh, to fund technologies, you know, across the the energy transition piece, whether that's energy storage or nuclear or hydrogen, you know, hydrogen features very heavily. Um, so I think, you know, it's uh, clearly, you know, there's a there's a strong push from from Bayes and government in terms of developing these hydrogen technologies and trying to to support and the, the foundations of a hydrogen economy. Um, but in terms of kind of going back to your question on energy storage, you know, we certainly see it playing a part hopefully obviously we're taking a portfolio approach we're not just looking at hydrogen we're looking at kind of thermal heat and kind of how that can be stored and how that can be useful uh, we're also looking at you know lots of other technologies but we certainly see it as you know a very um, promising and potential technology moving forward okay um alex views from yourself um i know you're, you're after the services rather than targeting specific technologies but do you see hydrogen and long duration part of the same area, or do you see that as a separate, um, yeah, a separate sector essentially? So I think hydrogen generation is definitely well, is very likely to be an important part of the mix. Um, Emma commented earlier that, they, that Aurora's got a slightly different view on the role of the very long duration storage and the role of other things in meeting those needs, and I think. Uh, I would agree that it's uncertain and I'm quite happy that other people have different views on it because it's 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 the most uncertain bit of it, I think, for me. Um, so I think it's likely that hydrogen generation is part of the mix. I'd like to see some uh, that the, the bid I'm unsure about is how much that the question was specifically about hydrogen peakers. And I'm not sure about that because the, 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 the idea of a peaker is that they're 
they're fast ramping so they go from nothing to full power quite quickly and they run for a few hours well short and medium duration storage will do that very well so so the hydrogen peaker will be competing in a space that storage is going to do pretty well at um so I, I suspect i'd see the hydrogen doing longer duration stuff than peaking um but a hydrogen peaker and a longer duration hydrogen they're not they're not that different as technologies um so so you, you could run the equivalent of a a hydrogen OCGT and run it for a bit longer and it's, it's just not going to be as efficient as if you'd had a hydrogen CCGT but it's not the end of the world so I think I think yes hydrogen generation is a good idea um, and uh, I think it's going to have a role and I think we should we should have some of it um, it's not clear exactly how much of it we need and exactly what role it's going to have yet okay thanks very much um, so I think um, we're coming to time. So I'd like to sort of ask one more round to you all of questions. Apologies, we haven't got to all the questions there. Please do continue the discussion on chat. The recording will be made live and the ESN is keen to explore a number of the things that we've raised today further across the year. On that front, um, I'd like to ask each of you, based on the discussion we've had today and the policy developments that we're seeing, what key action do you think the ESN uh, should be taking or pushing the industry and the sector and decision decision makers around to enable long duration to support net zero. What what would you ask? Uh, one thing you would ask of the ESN to do with the information that we've uh, been told today. Uh, maybe if I start with Emma. Thanks. Uh, more than anything, I think there needs to be clarity around the sort of support that long duration storage technologies might be given in the future. There's been a lot of discussions, there's been a lot of consultations out there, um, sort of suggesting different mechanisms and asking for views. Um, the response to that was published, um, but then we, we had REMA um, and there was more uh, sort of discussion within that around storage and, and the support mechanisms that it might need. But so far, I would say not enough clarity about what is actually likely to be implemented um, and, and what whether um, more support might be given to some technologies than others, um, how uh, policymakers are, are viewing it. And I think ultimately for um, developers and for investors, they need that clarity um, before sort of concrete next steps can be taken. Um, and, and more than anything, I, to me, that is, is what should be pushed for. Okay, thanks very much. Clarity, that's nice and clear. <laughs> um, I'll, Sophie. Uh, what would you ask of the ESN to, uh, to support your developments, but longer duration in general? It's hard to say something different to Emma. Um, I mean, the, the key, you're already banging the drum as the whole industry is on grid investment. So that's just needed full stop. And then specific um, roadmap of policy support and market signals for long duration storage is is key. So I think I'm saying the same as Emma. Um, we can all see the direction of travel that it's needed. Um, my fear is you, you're going to get to the late 2020s and it's just needed and it's 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 not of that the storage that's needed is not available in time and so you're still uh, reliant on fossil fuel um, solutions. So you, you've got to have that rep that roadmap and those type of policies need to be relevant for new technologies coming on, on board. So it's the support for pilots from, from Bayes and uh, Ahmed talked about kicking on from one TRL to the next. So we need to see that next wave once you come out of that. Um, and then those, those policies need to have long-term signals they need to be contracts of more than a decade and they need to be specific annual payments um, and a combination of them okay thank you a clear roadmap for policy and financial support that's that's great um alex um you know regen and, and the esn are working with you uh we're looking closely at the fares the future energy scenarios the bridging the gap program what else would you like to see from the esn in terms of uh, supporting the need uh, for long duration storage so I guess from from the ESN and 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 its members, um, I I quite I quite like modelling and I quite like a, sort of a diversity of modelling so that people come up with answers that aren't the same as our answers and then we can go look at them. So I, I quite like people to to work with us, but also nothing to do with us. Go go do your work completely somewhere else. Model the system and then and then publish 
um, what you've done and the details of how the assumptions you made and how you got there. And I'm, I'm really interested in the bits where we end up with different answers. Um, so I think there are places where it's really uncertain still, the very long duration stuff. I, I'd also like to look at the sort of the, the low regrets decisions you could make. So, so it, the, the far future is very, very uncertain, but maybe there's some things we could do in the, in the short and medium term that we're unlikely to regret. Um, and, and getting a bit more certainty on that would be really helpful if, if we got a few more people suggesting kind of, it looks like this is we're really unlikely to regret investing in a little bit of this technology so that we can start moving forward. I, I think there are some, some fairly obvious low regret things where in almost all future scenarios, we're gonna want a bit of that technology. So let's start building it. Great. Thanks, Alex. That's that's we want to add to the mix, complementary analysis and low regret. Amir, last but not least, um, what would you like, what would the government like to see from ESN in terms of your policy thinking on, on long duration storage? Yeah, well, I think uh, ESN is you know doing a lots of a lots of good stuff. Um, so let's not kind of uh, overlook that. I think uh, you know we're all you know, government, we're all here to try and enable the right conditions to move this sector forward. Uh, and I think you know ESN and its network probably can can kind of support us with the coordination piece in terms of bringing technology developers together as you're doing, bringing investors together as you're doing, the regulators together as you're doing, um, and really trying to help us fill the gap of you know how can we make this work um, essentially? Because I think you know the policymakers and then the regulators don't have all the answers, um, and I think it's about you know supporting the coordination of you know, the key stakeholders really and trying to move us along. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Also for all four of you saying something distinctly different. So that's uh, that's great stuff. I want to say thank you to our panel. It's been a fascinating discussion. In some ways scratched the surface, some ways de de delved into some detail. So we're going to wrap up from there. Um, sorry we're a couple of minutes over. Um, just to say, you know, we've got some other sessions coming up today, but if you're interested in getting involved in the working group, uh, the working groups that we have, or just in ESN generally as membership, please do get in touch with Ollie Franklin. The email is on there and all the material from the, from the conference will be available online. Um, we've got, as I said, we, we run a number of working groups. We've got two new ones for 2023, targeting around grid connections, which there are some questions that we didn't get to, but we are extremely excited about grid connections. Uh, and Rima, the, uh, the review of energy market arrangements. We have a working group that we're establishing around that, as well as the main working groups that we have. So there's a number of dates. Get in touch about how you can get involved and, and book your place onto those meetings. Um, and we've got two other sessions today. So this is the first of three on the last day. So we've got a session again at midday around fire safety. Um, we've got a session around grid connections at three o'clock. So it just leaves me to say a massive thank you to our panelists and also to all of our sponsors, Red Knight Taylor, Fluence, Schneider Electric, Ethical Power and Ampex. Um, and yeah, thanks very much for your questions and for being involved today. I hope you have a good rest of the day and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch again soon. Thanks very much, all the best. <laughs>